Okay, now it's recording. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to lecture seven, part one of the quantum theory in a nutshell course. Um, um, today I'll try to speak, I mean, in a lower volume because my throat is uh, Let me know so that I can uh, make it louder. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so, um, yesterday we started the discussion about um, what I I want to I wanted to call modern quantum theory, and. Um, the first point that we elaborated about was the particle wave duality. And as we discussed, um, the, the, um, the wave behavior of light was revealed in an experiment of a double slit. So you have a screen with two slits and you pass uh, light through it in such a way that um, um, when the two slits are open, what you see in the second screen here is precisely uh, in an interference pattern which is compatible with uh, the behavior of a wave. So you see that um, on this screen um, you're going to see uh, spots where uh, they are illuminated and some spots where they are dark. So you see that the waves, when they cross the slits, they will interfere and when they arrive uh, at the second screen, uh, the interference might be constructive or might be destructive. So after this experiment, uh, which is due to Young, uh, people uh, got convinced that um, um, light should be a wave. And then Maxwell came into the game and um, um, provided a theoretical um, um, explanation for the nature of light as being an electromagnetic wave. And then last week we spent a lot of time seeing how this wave behavior of light was challenged by uh, different experiments. And then uh, there was the proposal of the photon. So light was uh, actually was behaving like a beam of particles, a beam of photons. And yesterday we have discussed how, uh, how to deal with the mathematics of classical waves in the sense that I can compute what would be the interference pattern detected on the second screen just by taking um, the wave function, namely the function that describes the wave, um, and add the, the, the wave functions of the two waves, namely I'm superposing them. And after the sum, I can take the absolute value and the square. And we have argued that this is different from taking the intensity of the wave coming from one when I close the slit two and add, adding with the intensity of the wave coming from two when I close slit one. So the, the intensity that you see on the second screen when the two slits are open is not the same as the one that you obtain when you sum the intensities of slit one and slit two uh, separately. And this is a crucial uh, uh, property of, of waves, okay? And then uh, we have discussed uh, the fact that uh, this, um, um, this I12, uh, the intensity when the two slits are open, um, um, vary from zero to a maximum value. So it can be zero in the sense that you're going to see these dark lines uh, in, the, in the interference pattern. Um, but 
what happens is that if I close one of these leads, so you see this is the, the representation of uh, one slit open, and this is the representation when you have two slits open. And you see that when you have just one slit, well, you see that some places that were dark here are not dark here, and some places that were illuminated here are not illuminated here. So intensi the, the intensity that you see, the interference uh, pattern that you see when just one is lit is open can change with respect to this in the sense that um, um, you can really increase or decrease the intensity. So it really comes from the fact that waves can interfere in a constructive or in a destructive way. So when you close uh, one slit, you, you're going to block one of the waves and therefore uh, just one wave will arrive at the second screen and the consequence of that is uh, is the following. So you before places where there was destructive interference, um, this will not happen because you just have one wave and places where you have where you had constructive interference, also will disappear because now you just have one wave, okay? So let me see the chat before I move to the, to the experiment with particles. Um, oh, yeah, so thanks. Uh, I, I see that you wrote many, uh, many people wrote, sorry, I think it's about my, my throat pain, so <laughs> thank you. And uh, there is a question which is, it is the frequency we are observing? No, we are observing um, um, the intensity. So the intensity uh, uh, from the wave point of view is the uh, is related to the amplitude of the wave, okay? But remember, um, um, when we discussed about um, uh, electromagnetic waves in the previous week, uh, we discussed that the intensity is not uh, related to the frequency. So you can have uh, light, uh, different light beams with uh, the same frequency but different intensities. And what we are measuring the detector is um, um, what we, so someone asked to move back. Uh, so uh, what we are measuring is, is really the intensity, which is the, in the electromagnetic case, would be the square of the electric field that makes this wave, okay, that makes this wave. Um, so, is there any particular question about slide three? Ah, what is the result of I1 and I2? Well, the result is that I1 is phi1 squared and I2 is phi2 squared. So, the result of I1 plus I2 will be phi1 squared plus phi2 squared, which is not the same as the sum of phi1 and phi2, and the sum itself squared, okay? So there is a difference, uh, uh, and you see, I mean, you can graphically compute um, um, the result of the sum. You have here the plot of i1, so you have something that grows here and goes down here, and here you have i2, which is something that grows towards the, uh, this direction here. So if you add these two, you're going to have something like uh, um, a behavior of this type. So it will start at some value, it will grow up to a peak, and then we will start decreasing again, which is different from this pattern that we see here. Okay, and this is absolutely crucial. Okay, so Now, uh, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, okay, so is this before uh, they prove that light is also particle? So uh, uh, this experiment was performed even before Maxwell, but um, what I'm saying is that um, if you repeat this experiment, then you're going to see this uh, wave behavior as well. So you do see that light behaves as a wave and 
you can say, well, then light is a wave. But then we also saw that light can behave as a particle. So what is light? And yesterday we were discussing that, that um, these concepts of classifying uh, light as a, as a beam of particles or a wave, they are born due to the fact that we want to describe light as something that we know. But what we are concluding here is that light cannot be neither a particle nor a wave. It has a dual behavior. So sometimes light behaves as a wave and sometimes light behaves um, um, as a particle. So there is a famous physicist, uh, I think his first name is William, but I'm not sure, but the surname is Bragg. And uh, uh, he is known by, uh, by the uh, diffraction. And when they were trying to understand this, this confusing behavior of light, uh, he wrote, I, I, can, I, can, I can post this paper to you uh, in the website of the course. Uh, he wrote something like, uh, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, light behave as a particle or a wave, I don't know, one of them. And Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, light behave as a particle. So, <laughs> And on Sundays, I think, uh, well, I don't remember what he says about Sundays, but uh, I mean, he was joking with the fact that um, you went to the lab and uh, um, you could not see, uh, you could not know how light would behave uh, by doing some experiment because sometimes it looks like a particle, sometimes it looks like a wave, so what light is? And then he said, well, depend on the day that you're looking at it. Uh, so the, the name uh, is Brag, uh, but I can post the, the paper that he writes that um, on the website of the course. Um, yeah, Mahmoud said that this weekend, yeah, so Sunday we don't care about uh, uh, the nature of light because you're taking some rest. Um, Felix asked, uh, did you say if you add the two? Yeah, so I was I was referring to the fact that if you add the intensities um, naively, just take this intensity I1 and add to the intensity I2, you do not get this pattern here, okay? So uh, in order to get this pattern here, you have to add the wave functions, phi1 and phi2, and then take the square. If you add the intensities, what you're going to do is to add the squares, and this is different, right? This is totally different. Okay, so now uh, I want to restart from where we stopped yesterday, which is the description of the Young experiment with classical particles, okay? So now we are going to replace the source S in the previous slide that was emitting a wave uh, by a source that now emits particles. And you can think of that as, I mean, just you know, a source that sends a particle, a, a beam of particles at a constant rate against this screen uh, with two slits. Um, and uh, I mean, the, the concrete proposal that I write here is that S is a tiny cannon uh, and it is shooting cannonballs at a fixed rate. And uh, the important property is that this cannon can rotate and uh, randomly and can shoot these cannonballs in random directions, okay? Um, so you have the, the two slits here and um, there is the second screen and there is this detector D which is moving uh, from up to down and, and uh, I mean, in an oscillatory way and the task of this detector is to collect the balls uh, in some particular spot of this screen. And after uh, several rounds of this experiment, um, you can tell what is the chance of detecting, of getting a ball at uh, a given uh, 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 region here, a small region, let's say from this point to this point, you, you know, 
you can I can ask you what is the chance of getting a ball uh, here and you can say if it is high or if it is low okay um, now uh, uh, well we can we can repeat the argument that we did before you can close for instance slit 2 and just let uh, uh, slit 1 to be opened and the cannonball, the, the cannon, sorry, will shoot the cannonballs against this screen, and some balls will uh, um, will pass through slit one. And as I said, uh, if the so the, the 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 cannonball does not break up, so the cannonball always gets uh, to the screen. I mean, perfectly. And if it hits one of the corners of this slit, then it bounces. Okay, so this is an important property that I want to impose in order to explain uh, my point. So if you shoot a cannonball in, the, in this corner, it will hit this corner and will bounce in another direction. But if you shoot and it does not interact with any of the corners of the slit, then it will just pass through. Okay, so just playing with this, this experiment, you can see that when you just let a slit one open, um, um, you're going to see that you, ha <coughs> you have higher chances of detecting uh, cannonballs in this region here and smaller chances of getting cannonballs in this region here, okay? So P1 represents the probability of finding a cannonball in, this, in different points of this screen. Now you can repeat the same, um, the same experiment but you close slit one and leave slit two open, okay? And what happens is that the cannonballs will uh, again pass through slit two, and if slit one is closed, then you're going to see a similar pattern, but for slit two now. So the chances of finding cannonballs in this region is uh, uh, higher than the chances of finding cannonballs in this region, okay? But now, I just open uh, the two slits and uh, shoot the cannonballs against this slit. This sorry, this is screen. Uh, why higher? Uh, in, in, what do you mean by why higher? Um, so why why the chances of getting cannonballs here is higher than the chance of getting cannonballs? Here? Yeah. So if if slit slit one is closed, okay then you're going to shoot uh, cannonballs in direction of this lead two. So, and you see that those that can pass uh, through this lead two, they will be concentrated in this region because in order for them to get to this region, they must hit this specific corner here in such a way that they will bounce to this direction. Okay. So there is much more room for balls to arrive here than for, for balls to hit this corner and come in this direction. Because you see, you have to perfectly hit this corner. If you hit just a, a bit down, then the cannonball will not pass through. So the chances of getting more cannonballs here is higher. Is, is that clear? Okay, I'll try to repeat. Um, so imagine that this lit one is closed and you start just shooting uh, uh, cannonballs against lit two, okay? Do you agree? So let's assume that I have a fixed direction, okay? Do you agree that uh, if I, if I'm, uh, you know, if I have enough skills to, to tune the direction of the cannon and I pass and the cannonball is, uh, is small enough to pass through this lead two, then there is a way of passing the cannonball perfectly so that it does not hit any of the corners of this lead. Okay? So the cannonball will pass through uh, this slit in the middle of it. And now assume that I start changing, I, I will start changing a bit the direction of this, the, the, the cannon. So some of the cannonballs now, if I, if I rotate this in this direction, so if I rotate it down, 
then some of the cannonballs will pass through, but at some point, the cannonball will perfectly hit this point. And when it perfectly hits this point, then it bounces to this direction. Okay? Do you understand that? Okay. So, also, if I rotate up the cannon, then some of the cannonballs will hit this corner here, and they will be deviated from, from you know, they'll be deflected in this direction here. Now, imagine that this cannon is rotating back and forth, okay? So it's rotating like that. And you see that there is this entire space here for the balls to pass through slit two without touching the corners. So if they never touch the corners, then they'll just come as a straight lines and hit the cannon, the, the screen here, okay? In, 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 this, in this region here. But there is one single point, which is this, uh, this corner of my, my screen, that if the cannonball hits this corner, then it goes up, okay? So I have much more space of passing the cannonball through this slit without touching any of its corners than just touching one of the corners, right? So if this cannon is rotating randomly, the chances of hitting this specific point, which is a very particular point, is lower than the chance of passing through this entire region here, okay? So the chances of getting trajectories that will not be deflected and will fly to this region here is higher than the chances of having a trajectory that will hit this corner and bounces up, right? Is that clearer now? Okay, very good. So you see that this will be the pattern, the chances of getting balls when the slit one is closed and the slit two um, is open in this region is higher than the chances of getting cannonballs in this region, okay? Um, the use of the screen, well, the screen, you see this, this cannon is shooting cannonballs in all directions. But if the cannonball hit the screen, then the ball will just bounce back. It will, not, it will not pass through the second screen, okay? So just the, the, the balls that can pass through the slit will hit this thing. And now we can ask, I mean, um, why we are doing that? Well, because we want to understand the difference between the particle behavior and the wave behavior. We understood what happens with the wave when the wave passes uh, through the slits. But now we can ask, well, if it was not a wave, but rather a beam of particles, what are we going to see in this screen? And this will make us uh, uh, um, um, aware of the differences between the wave behavior and the particle behavior. And this is exactly what we want to understand about light. Right? That's why we are repeating the same experiment that we did uh, with waves, now with particles. Is that clear? Okay. So I think there is another question that I didn't answer. Uh, okay, so does the detector stop some of the cannonballs? Yes. Uh, if the, the cannonball just hit the screen, it will be reflected immediately. So it's not going to, to pass through this region. So this screen is like a wall, okay? If the cannonball hits uh, the, this wall, it will not pass through. So it's, a, it's a, a rigid obstacle for the balls, for the cannonballs, okay? Okay, very good. So. Um, um, I don't understand how light can be considered as particle. 
Well, it's good that you don't understand because this is extremely non-trivial. But look, at the moment, I'm not talking about light. I'm talking about just cannonballs. Um, we are going to we are going to come back to light at some point soon. Well, uh, I mean, you're right. It, it it's weird. I mean. If you do the young experiment with light, you see the, the, the behavior of a wave. But um, if you want to treat light as a wave, then you cannot explain the photoelectric effect. You cannot explain the black body radiation. You cannot explain the Compton shift. So light, I mean, the young experiment is just one experiment that uh, in order to be explained, uh, you have to treat light as a wave. But um, if you want to do another experiment involving light, like the photoelectric effect experiment, you cannot insist on the wave nature of light. OK? So if people uh, decided to do the photoelectric effect experiment before young, they would conclude that light was a particle. And that that's 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 why it's weird i mean it's it has this, this dual behavior so you should not think of light as being either a particle or a wave but actually you have to think the opposite light does not fit any of this description that we know so light is not a wave and light is not a particle you have to you know you have to um make yourself aware that these concepts they become uh, uh, old-fashioned when you come to the microscopic world okay it, it is it is extremely weird uh, but this is something that um, um, how can I say um, you can find it very weird, but uh, uh, I mean, things are. Uh, if 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 you find something that you you don't like or you don't understand, you ask nature. So you do an experiment, and nature tells you what is the truth. Okay, and then it's not nature nature's fault if we don't understand immediately what what is happening so we just we just see what is i mean we, we just see what nature tells and and we have to try to figure out the description for that um there is a question uh, how do solar panels work so i i can come to this at some point but I, I don't want to discuss that now because it will deviate our discussion since it's not uh, particularly uh, important for for the moment but i can i can answer your question of course but not now, if that's okay. Um, uh, there is a question by John. Um, well, you cannot say that they were wrong in the sense that uh, they were describing particular uh, a phenomena so and for those phenomena that they were describing light was behaving either as a wave or a particle but it turns out that uh, the theories that they they have the theories that they have developed are not complete so for instance um, you you are having um, um, you are having a course on relativity, and you see that um, Newtonian mechanics is not valid if you consider something moving at speeds comparable to the speed of light. Does it mean that Newton is wrong? Well, it means that Newton's theory has a limitation, so you have to apply it up to some speed uh, scale, otherwise you are going to get wrong results. So it's the same here. Okay, so if you if you want to treat light as a wave in all scales and for all different phenomena, you are going to get wrong answers. 
And if you want to treat light as a particle for all scales and all experiments, you are going to get wrong answers. So the theory is, is limited. Um, so there is uh, um, Elise said, if you consider light as an ele electromagnetic wave, how it isn't a wave? Well, as I said, I mean, the for several experiments and for several phenomena, if you describe light as a wave, you're going to get a perfectly valid uh, description. But I'm just saying that if you want to treat light as a wave in all different occasions and all different experiments that involve light, you're not going to get correct results. So I'm not saying that uh, uh, it is wrong to treat light as a wave. I'm just saying that you cannot treat light as a wave for all different experiments and phenomena you want to describe. Okay. Um, so, um, the, I, I understand that this is a very non-trivial thing uh, to digest, and it takes time. So, this confusion, it's absolutely natural and necessary because if you don't get confused with this dual behavior, it, it would be very weird, <laughs> okay? Uh, so I, I, I understand the confusion, and I think this confusion is exactly the natural reaction when you learn this thing for the first time, okay? But what I'm saying is, so far, we don't have a systematic description of what is going on, and we are just reproducing what comes out from experiments, okay? I hope uh, I answered all the questions so far, and uh, I want to continue with the description of the Young experiment for particles. And I described the situation where just one slit is open and the other is closed, and uh, we have seen that the chances or the probability of finding cannonballs in this region when the slit one is open is like that. So it's higher in this region and the smaller in this region. If you close slit one and let uh, slit two open, then the, you're going just to you know uh, reflect the behavior. So the chances of getting more cannonballs in this uh, region is like that. But now you can repeat the experiment and ask what happens if you open the two slits. So now you have cannonballs that will fly uh, together uh, in this region and well, they interact with each other and so on. And if it's, n if it's uh, absolutely uh, non-trivial for you to understand this, this is the result of an experiment that the chances of finding uh, uh, cannonballs when the two slits are open, the chances are higher if you're looking at the center here. So you're going to find more cannonballs in this region here. And when you go to, you know, uh, to the corners of your screen, the chances get lower. Okay. Um, there is a question, is D a detector? Yes, D is a detector. It's a moving detector, so it moves around here. Um, okay, so... Let me move to um, the next slide. And so this P that I introduce here is the probability of finding uh, a cannonball, and here you can have, uh, um, you know, a tiny spacing like dx, and multiplying p by dx will give you the probability of finding a cannonball in this spacing of dx, between x and dx, in x plus dx, sorry. So, we don't call this piece 
probabilities, but we rather call, um, uh, well, it's a probability density. Okay? Because you have to multiply P by dx, which is the, the size of the region that you want to ask uh, um, uh, what are the chances of finding a cannonball there in order to get the probability. Okay? Uh, is Px the probability that one cannonball goes through slit i if only slit i is open, or the probability that we'll find cannonballs in some particular region? So the prob yeah okay good question. So p i is the probability or the probability density if if you wish to have uh, to find the cannonball in 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 a particular region of this screen. So if I take for instance um this tiny uh, piece here if i multiply p1 by the size of this this uh, region here I, I will give to you the probability of finding cannonballs in this that's that's the meaning of this piece Okay, so now let me uh, P one two graph looks like the cannonballs are not so P one two uh, is when you have the two cannonballs flying around, and it is just shows that when the two slits are opened, then the chances of getting uh, um, cannonballs is higher here in the center. Okay, so this is uh, this is what you see from the from the experiment. Um, and there is a question by Silas: uh, Is the probability density different from the wave function? This is a very important question. So, but for the moment. We are just talking about particles, which are cannonballs, and they just go through slits. So, so far, there is no such a thing as wave function, right? Because, I mean, we are just talking about particles that, that, that fly from one point to another point. So there is no, no meaning of, uh, the, I mean, when you, you want to describe cannonballs, you don't introduce a wave function for them, okay? So, but, your comment will be extremely important very soon. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, so this P1 and P2, they are the probability distributions or the probability densities when just one of these leads, uh, uh, just one of them is open. Uh, so if we assume that the cannonballs will not break up, as we assumed already, uh, there is no such a thing of detecting half of a cannonball. So if either a cannonball hits the screen, the second screen, or it doesn't. So you don't see just a piece of a cannonball. Um, and also, a cannonball has to choose what is the slit that it's going to pass through. Okay, so it either passes through slit one or through slit two, but it doesn't pass through slit one and two at the same time. So this is, look, this is different from the wave behavior because a wave is a delocalized uh, 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 perturbation that will pass through two slits at the same time. So particles, they are very different in this sense because they are localized. So either particle, uh, the particle or the cannonball pass through slit one or pass through slit two, okay? Um, and this, those events, namely the events of, of the cannonballs passing through slits one and two, they are independent, okay? And therefore, uh, uh, the probabilities from the theory of probabilities can be added because they are independent events, okay? 
So the probability of getting um, um, the probability distribution of getting a cannonball uh, um, at x is given by the sum of the probabilities p1 and p2. Okay. Um, there is an important difference here. So if we want to make the analogy with the, the, the wave that we discussed, you have to think about the following. Um, we had there that the intensity one, two was different from the intensity of one plus the intensity of two. This was different. If you want to think of the probability here as the analog of the, the intensity, then you better uh, uh, see that this is different because the probability of finding a cannonball at X or the probability distribution of finding a cannonball at X um, when the two slits are open is the sum of the probabilities, okay? So this is different from what we have seen for waves. And also, if we close one of these slits, okay? So now if I close one of these slits, since uh, P1 and P2 are both positives, okay? Then P12 can only be smaller or, I mean, unaffected at a point X. So this quantity is bigger or equal than zero at X. This quantity is bigger or equal than zero at X. So if I close one of these slits, I will remove, for instance, if I close slit two, I have to set P2 to zero, okay? And the probability will be just P12 will be just P1. But since this number is non-negative, then if I'm removing this guy, then P12 will be either equal to the previous result if P P2 is zero, or it will be smaller, okay? Um, this is different from the wave behavior, right? Because when I closed one of these leads, we saw that we can either increase the intensity that we see on the second screen or decrease the, 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 the intensity we see on the screen too. So um, for particles, the probability distribution can only decrease, okay? And this is different from, from a wave behavior. So you see that using this double slit experiment, I can tell you if what is passing behaves as a particle or behaves as a wave, just by looking at this uh, 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 distribution that you're going to see in this screen, okay? There is another important property, which is the following. So I told you that if you are passing a wave, through the two slits, and you decrease the intensity of this wave, then you're going to see uh, an interference pattern on the second screen, which has a lower intensity, okay? And you can keep those, you can keep the experimental setup there for a long time, and you're going to see that the intensity will not grow on the second screen. But now, assume that I decrease the rate of shooting of my cannon. So my cannon, ball, my cannon was uh, shooting cannonballs at some rate, I don't know, 40 cannonballs per second. And now I decrease this, this rate and it's shooting, I don't know, two cannonballs per second. And I let this cannon to, to be shooting cannonballs for, for a while, okay? Um, you see that after a sufficiently large amount of time, the pattern that you're going to see on the second screen will be very similar to the pattern that you saw 
um, uh, with the 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 large uh, rate of shooting. So if you wait long enough, you're going to see the same pattern. Okay, and this is different from the waves because with the waves, if I decrease the intensity, I will decrease the intensity on screen two, and this will be you know smaller, uh, irrespective of how long you wait. Okay, this is also a difference from uh, waves and and particles. Okay, good. Now after uh, this discussion about the double slit experiment for waves, for classical waves and classical particles, I want to uh, perform the same experiment, but now instead of throwing um, waves of water or cannonballs, I will throw electrons. And um, why electrons? Well, electrons are mic microscopic particles, and we are. I'm advocating that quantum mechanics effect will be uh, extremely um, important when you want to describe uh, microscopic physics. So electrons uh, are a good candidate to test that. But besides that. Uh, De Broglie told us that um, it might be uh, uh, that we have to uh, treat uh, the electron not only as a particle, at, as we are used to do, but also as a wave. So De Broglie uh, wanted to uh, extend the particle wave duality that people were seeing for light to matter. So the electron will have a matter wave or a wave of matter associated to it, okay? So just by repeating the, the, the relation between momentum and wavelength, you could define a wavelength for the electron. But this proposal is very speculative. I mean, how can, can we be sure that electrons will have this dual behavior. Well, um, we have an experiment, which is the double slit experiment, that allows us to distinguish if uh, uh, something behaves, look, I'm using the word behaves as a particle, or if it behaves as a wave. Since electrons are, um, uh, objects that we treat as particles and we throw electrons against uh, the double slit screen, I will expect to see uh, this type of pattern that we just discussed. But if electrons can be treated as waves and if electrons behave as waves sometimes, then we will see something like that. Okay? So, we can ask, I mean, um, in the end, if I send electrons towards the double slit experiment, um, um, what is the, the pattern that we are going to detect on the second screen? Okay. So you can imagine that this type of experiment is very difficult to perform. The reason being the following, um, electrons are particles, as our traditional view, that are quite light. So the, 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 the mass of electron is, is very light. So if you throw an electron uh, towards a target, then uh, you must be sure that the environment is sufficiently empty so that the electron can go through this path and there is nothing that will interact with the electron and disturb the, 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 the path, okay? So the, the double slit experiment with electrons is very challenging and you have to provide, you have to place the experiment 
in a very good vacuum. So you have to avoid as much as possible uh, obstacles in the path of an electron. Okay, so, but I mean, it is difficult, but people have done that. So we can, um, uh, we can discuss the results. And I, I think, um, yeah, so the Broglie proposal was uh, made around 1923. And the first experiment that really verified that electrons can actually behave as waves, I think it was done around 1927, so like four years later. So for quite some time, let me four years or so, the idea uh, that De Broglie put forward was just a speculation, okay? Um, a uh, speculation based on symmetry. Namely, De Broglie was thinking, well, light behaves as particle or waves, so there is this dual behavior, but why light and not everything? So uh, he wanted to make sure that nature was, uh, in this sense, symmetric. So it was not giving preference to light, but all, all, all uh, the matter itself would be dual, uh, particle wave dual. Okay. So um, now we are going to repeat the experiment, the double slit experiment, and describe what you see. Uh, but I'm just, I, I'm just going to tell you what is the outcome of the experiment. Okay. So. Um, the setup is the same, so I don't have to draw it again. Uh, and the results are the following. The detector D, that detector that was moving on the second screen, always detect an integer number of electrons. So you see that this is a property that is very similar to the property of the cannonballs. You don't detect half of a cannonball, you detect just one cannonball or non-cannonball. And the same happens for electrons. You don't detect half of an electron. Either you detect uh, the electron or you don't detect, I mean, or, or there is no electron. So you detect or you don't detect, okay? So typically these particle detectors, they, they, they make a sound like a click when, when the particle arrives. So you can think that either the detector will click or will not. OK. Um, now we state the following. If the source that emits the electrons is sufficiently weak, so in the case of, of a wave, you can think of you're reducing the intensity. And if in the case of the cannonballs, you can think that I'm, I'm decreasing the rate of shooting. So if the source is sufficiently weak, it is conceivable to have electrons uh, uh, flying one by one. So it's, it's like if you have something that emits electron, you can decrease the intensity or the shooting rate in such a way that it will emit an electron by electron. Okay. Um, in this case, they get to the points uh, X on the second screen randomly distributed as in the classical particle experiment, okay? So if you make these electrons uh, uh, very, uh, 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 with energies very, very low, or the, 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 the source that emits the electron is emitting uh, just one electron per time, per, per second, then you're going to see that the distribution is very similar to the distribution of classical particles. However, <laughs> uh, if uh, uh, you wait long enough, so the, the electrons are arriving on the second screen, but since the source is emitting few electrons uh, per time unit, you have to wait long enough such that 
when you, after waiting a lot, you just look at the second screen and something uh, weird happens. And what is weird is that the electrons will appear in the, so you don't see the electrons, right? So, but you can, for instance, the screen, you can, you can put a material that when an electron hits the, the, the screen, there is a, a, a tiny cell that will pass uh, an, an electric current and it will illuminate. So you can, you can really make this visible. It, so if you look at the second screen after waiting a long time, what you're going to see is that these cells that compose the screen will be illuminated in the same pattern as you have seen for waves, okay? Again, if you pass few electrons, uh, if your source is emitting few electrons per time unit, and you wait long enough, so you, you know, you just let the, the source emitting electrons, you go out for lunch, and when you come back, you observe the screen where uh, the electrons are being collected, you see a pattern that is not a pattern of a particle distribution, but rather a, a pattern of a wave interference. Okay, so this is what you see from an experiment. I'm not. I'm not making any any guesswork here. This is an experiment, and you can see that. Right. So, if um, I said that when you start throwing the electrons against the, the double slit. In the very beginning, you can see something that behaves as particle. And therefore, you can compute the probability distributions. Now, after waiting long enough, you can compute the probability distribution. But because these electrons will present an interference pattern that is different from, uh, so it will present, they will present an interference pattern, which is something completely different from a particle distribution. And therefore, the probability of finding an electron at position, the probability distribution of finding an electron at position X, when the two slits are opened, is not the sum of the probability of getting an electron at position X with just the first slit open, plus the probability of getting an electron at position X with just the second slit open. And um, what happens is that, and this is the, the most, let's say, shocking part, to my opinion, is that if you now close one of these slits, we saw that for particles, the distribution can only decrease or stay the same, okay? But it cannot increase. And for electrons, we see that the probability P12 can increase when one of, when one of these leads is closed. So, what is going on? We are seeing a mix of behaviors here, right? So. In the beginning, we thought they were particles, but then we waited long enough, they looked like waves. And if you close one slit, it looks like waves. Um, and um, I want to continue on this discussion, but for that, I will, uh, I, will, I will give you a break, and then we continue, because this is a very important part. For now, I just stated the, the results of the experiment, okay? So there is a question, is the mass of the electron affecting the result? Uh, not really. I mean, um, this is not, well, in a sense it affects, but not, uh, not the result of the experiment. It affects the, 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 the very fact that we can detect this particle wave behavior uh, for an electron, and for instance, we, you cannot detect this particle wave behavior for a cannonball, right? 
there is no way no way of waiting long enough cannonballs being shot against a uh, 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 double slit and you're going to see a wave interference pattern there this is not going to happen and this is related to uh, the mass of the cannonball so it's because the cannonball is a macroscopic object and the electron is a microscopic object so it has a tiny tiny mass okay so in this sense it is related it is affected but what i'm saying is that uh, the interference pattern will appear if you replace electrons by protons if you replace electrons by neutrons if you replace electrons by molecules and so on this is going to happen okay so i will continue the discussion after the break so we see each other again in 10 minutes and you'd have 10 minutes to you know digest this crazy outcome of this experiment okay so see you